Give somebody a hug. Let them know you're happy they're here. Tell them, man, you picked the right one today. You picked the right one. Pick the right one. Sweet Jesus. Hallelujah. Ha. Ah. If you're here Friday night, man, we had a, we had a, man, if you got a testimony for Friday night, I really need you to email it in. The burning room was burning. It was burning, Isaac. Burning. Hey, you know, Easter's coming up, Resurrection Sunday. Anybody excited about that? Anybody excited about the resurrection? I'm more excited about the resurrection than I am Resurrection Day. However, I'm still pretty excited about it. You know, there's a lot of controversy about Resurrection Sunday. Is it Easter? What do we call it? Where do the eggs come from? Many believe it's pagan, the Oster. I, I, I heard an amazing teaching by Dr. Leonard Sweet uh, about um, 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 ostrich eggs in the early church, which I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I've been doing some research on it, and, and uh, they found this old script, an old artwork that they think may be the beginning, uh, Lillian, if you could, just um, they think that could possibly be where the Easter bunny comes from. They're not actually sure if that could be it. I'm not saying, I'm not setting doctrine here. It's just possible. That's all I know. Jesus said it, I believe it. That settles it, right? I don't know. I don't know. So, hey, yeah, I was, um, you know, I was gone all week last week. Remember I told you about that? I was, uh, you know, in my master's cohort. And you could take that down because they're not even going to listen to me now, Lillian. You just put up our, 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 our series graphic here. I was gone all week. Um, I was in North Carolina where it got very cold for a moment. You know, you know it's, it was snowing in Raleigh last week? Why would you live up there? I don't get it. I just, I don't get why you would live cold. But I was, I was, I was, um, I was in, I was in Raleigh, or excuse me, I was in um, Concord, uh, North Carolina, studying for my master's. And um, I was there all week. And uh, I was there Tuesday. Uh, I flew out Monday. I flew back on Saturday. Uh, my flight was supposed to get in at 1030. Uh, and then I would come here in the morning, and my wife was able to uh, change my flight into an earlier flight. So I was supposed to fly out at 4, but then uh, my flight got delayed. And, you know, I was, uh, I'd been in school all week. I'd kind of been working on my message. And then, and then uh, I was in the airport, actually, on Saturday, finishing up my message for last week. That was one of those messages that took all week. I kind of had to cook a little bit. I had to sit in the slow cooker, right? The, like they got the magic pot now, right? I don't know what, instant pot. A lot of messages look like they came out of Instant Pot, right? Like, uh, like you wonder if that's a preacher joke. But um, so I was working on this one all week on the slow cooker, and I was working on it even um, in the airport. Uh, and then I met someone really nice, had a neat divine appointment in, in Concord uh, with someone who lives in Boca, which was really cool. Invited them uh, to our Easter service. And, and uh, I got, got home uh, Saturday night, woke up Sunday morning came to church, preached the gospel, had a great, great, great time. Then we went to the Johnson wedding, right? Uh, uh, Tanisha Ten yeah. and Mario got married last, last Sunday, which was great. <clears throat> um, and that was great. And uh, so I've been gone all week, and then I went to a, a wedding, and then um, I finally got home, I was a little tired, um, I was ready to just hang out with my family, and I uh, had some dinner. I don't remember, uh, did we eat or we just, we just ate at the wedding? And uh, so I get home, and, and uh, my wife and I are ready to hang out. I hadn't seen her in over a week. And then I got this little pain in my stomach. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I got a little pain in my stomach. And, I, and, and everybody in this church just seemed got sick the week I was away, and I was so happy that I missed it. I know, you know, I want to comfort you in your time of sorrow. But at the same point, you know, there was a time of separation in the name of Jesus, right? And so <clears throat> I was happy that that time of sanctification was there for me. But then I started feeling this, this, this pain in my stomach, and it wasn't going away, and I ate everything I could, to, I, all, the, all the medicines. I Just give me all the medicines to make this pain go away. I'll take all of them, right? Pink, purple, whatever they are, right? And then, uh, and then, it, then, it, then, it, then it started to, like, the, the world didn't feel so good, right? And, uh, and then I started feeling a little queasy. Anybody, anybody experienced this recently? Has anybody experienced this? is 
death was at my door, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Knock, and I said, you cannot come in. I've had a very long week. I'm not, we're not doing this. I don't get sick like this. I have two microphones. <laughs> microphone. Hallelujah. Now I have one microphone. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so now, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so, so it was about 10 o'clock and I was like, honey, I don't feel so good. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure what's happening, but I'm not, I'm not feeling so good. And then I was like, am I getting, am I getting nauseous? That's not happening. I'm not, I'm not getting nauseous. You're getting nauseous. I'm not getting nauseous. And, uh, and then I don't know if this is too much information, but then I proceeded to explode for the next six hours. Uh, I, I, I mean, literally, my body was like, why do you have anything inside of me? There should be nothing inside of me right now. Everything that can be shaken, as the word says, was shaken. And, uh, and you know how when it says the Lord will examine your inner parts? I was able to examine my inner parts the entire evening. I think at one point I passed the lung. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what happened. I had an extra kidney or something that I lost. And, um, and so all, all Sunday night, I was crying out in intercession, Oh, Jesus, what's happening? Why, Lord, am I dying right now? I don't know what's happening. Has anybody been there? I was so ill. I was so ill, I was dying. I, I wasn't sure what happened. Now, now, 12 hours earlier, I was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 12 hours later, I was out there, Eli, Eli, Lama, Zama, God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where are you, God of my salvation? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You start questioning, like, Lord, I've been tithing. How could I possibly get this sick? I've been serving you all these years, and yet you abandoned me in my hour of sorrow. I don't understand how I could, hold on a second, God, I got to go throw up again, right? And so I go, <laughs> and I'm talking to Jesus laying on the bathroom floor. What have I done to deserve this? <laughs> Dying. Why, Lord, I'm young. I have young kids. I have still things I want to do. Right, Lillian? You got it, right? What? What did I do? What? What? Who did I? What did I fellowship with? Where are you, God? Right? It's so funny. We go from the mountaintop to the valley that quickly. Is it true or is it true? Oh, my. I'll, and then I was just basically dead all day Monday. And I just, I, 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 I kind of came out of my pit on Wednesday. But here, here, here's the Here's a question I have for you. And, and, and you know, what, what do you do when you feel like God is hiding from you? Because that's what it felt like. It felt like all night long God was hiding from me. What have I, what, is it my breath? Clearly it's my breath right now. Because all my inners are my outers at this moment, right? What, what, do you, what do you do? What do you do when you feel like God is hiding from you? And it, and it could feel like a long season or it could feel like a moment. Right? It could feel like just like I was right with you yesterday. We were walking together. We were accomplishing stuff. And now all of a sudden, I don't even know if you know where I live. Right? Yeah. And it feels like he's hiding from you. And, and, and as we're working our way through the book of Stephen, Stephen, of course, we're in, uh, excuse me, the book of Stephen, book of Acts. Thank you, honey. Uh, as we're working our way through the book of Acts, we're at Stephen, and Stephen is in the trial. It's the third trial so far in the book of Acts, like we've talked about. And Stephen is in front of the, uh, the Sanhedrin, and, uh, and he's, given, he's given them this story of, 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 of Israel and how Israel, time and again, Jesus tried to let them know, like, hey, we're here. I'm here to, to, to work with you, to save you, to bring about good and fruitful religion. And time and time again, they turned their back on God, right? And, uh, and he gets to the point where Stephen starts telling the story that basically is found in uh, uh, Exodus chapter 32, where they were in the wilderness. Remember, and Moses had led them out of captivity. And uh, Moses, God had called Moses up on the mountain. And uh, after, after one month, after one month, they start questioning. They start questioning. They start, they're like, where, 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 where is this Moses you sent us? He's gone. He's gone. We've been abandoned. God is now hiding from us. We're on our own. Like, what happened? You led us out of Egypt, 
And now we're alone. And Stephen says this way in Acts 7, 39. He says, our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to God and to Moses, but repudiated him. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. One month, they had been slaves all those years, hundreds of years. And in one month of not knowing where Moses was, their hearts turned back to Egypt. Crazy. Like, we look at the, the stories in the Bible, and we're like, this just, how could this ever happen? And I was on the border in 12 hours, right? Like, they were in 30 days, it was 12 hours, I was wondering where God was. And so what do they do, though? They, they, they turn to Aaron, right? They turn to Aaron, and, and as he tells the story, he says to Aaron, hey, Aaron, get all, they're like, Aaron, we need a God to worship. Moses is gone. He's gone, went up on the mountain, God killed him. We need a new God. And Aaron's like, I got an idea. You need a God, I'll get you a God. And so they, they get all, I don't know if you read this story in, um, in, in, in Exodus, uh, but they get all the jewelry from the women. Haven't you noticed that? When religion comes, it's the women who suffer the most. It's always the women who get robbed of their identity when religion, come, when religion comes, right? And so they say, get all the gold from the women, get their jewelry, get their earrings, melt it down, and we're going to make a calf. And that's what we'll do. I'll make you a calf, and we'll make you a god, and we'll all worship that. And so they went from the god that, like, sent plagues and stuff and all this supernatural and parting waters to, to that. Like, we'll just worship that. That looks like something. That looks good. That's a good replacement right there, right? That ought to be a good replacement. I'll worship a cow. Like, what? What? And then Aaron said, this is your God. And they're like, yeah, we got a God. Now, why a calf? I don't, like, if you're going to make a God, at least make it you, right? I mean, like, just, at least there's money in it that way, right? But no, they, they make a cow. And, and, so, and so God, you know, is, is, is you know, they, they, they <laughs> so, I don't even get this. So God and Moses are on the mountain, and Moses says, or God says to Moses, hey, um, yeah, we're having a good time together, right? And he's like, yeah, man, we're having a great time together. This is awesome. Talking to you, we're getting revelations. God's like, yeah, hey, um, that people that you brought with you, um, yeah, right now they're making a cow out of gold, and they're calling it God. Moses like, nah, that's not happening. I know, I know that's not happening, right? He's like, nah. And God's like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's really happening. You might want to go back down there and deal with that, right? And so he comes down, and, 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 and Moses ha has, has to deal with it. And, and as I'm studying this story, this is what pops into my head. This is what the Lord tells me. He says, sometimes when, when, when God, here, put it up for me if you would, please, Lillian. Sometimes when God is hidden, our idols are revealed. Wow. 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 Sometimes when God is hidden, our idols are, are, re are revealed. And, um, and, and don't you find this happening sometimes? Like, like when things aren't working out exactly right, what do you, what do you turn to? What, what do you turn to? That's when our idols are revealed. And so many people, their idol is discouragement. They actually worship discouragement. And discouragement is always there to comfort them when things don't work out. Right? It's, it's, it's an idol. And, and what we do is we start fantasizing about the good old days. All of a sudden, the old days become the good old days. The days we couldn't wait to escape somehow, <laughs> somehow become the good old days. Isn't it funny how that happens? All you need is a little time on your problems, and they become the good old days. We never think of that when we're in the problem. One day, I want you to think about this. One day, discouraged you is going to think today is the good old days. That's bizarre to think about, right? It's just bizarre to think about, right? But, but we, we reach back on our idols, and um, we start fantasizing about good old days, and, and uh, you know, and, and, and Stephen was telling them, he's like, man, you had the law, and, and you had Moses, you know, you worship, you worship this, you worship the law, you worship the Moses, you worship this whole system, but he says like, but, 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 but people never followed Moses when he was alive, you're worshiping these good old days, that weren't actually good old days. You're worshiping a system that Moses brought about, but you didn't follow him when he was here. 
It's a fantasy system. It's a fantasy system. And, you know, few of us make idols on purpose, but they're just so comforting, right? They just, they just begin to just coddle us in our times of, of trouble, and they don't really require anything of us, right? Instead, they just get us kind of turned from God. And, and, and God rarely destroys our idols for us. Instead, he just keeps them from being profitable. And what I found is what, when we have true idols, what God does is he just actually keeps us from ever really coming into our promise. We can look so close. We look so close to it. So close to it. But we never actually come into it because he doesn't want to share the glory with your idol. And since you love Jesus, he loves you enough to not let you have an idol that gets glory. I want you to hear this. He'll let you have an idol. He just won't let you have one that gets glory. And so we stay stuck. Like these fools worshiping a gold cow. Just stuck. Does this make sense? We, we, we get stuck. These idols lock us into something that's not living. And they make us stuck. And I, and I today, all I really want to do in a couple last minutes that we have here together, I just want to help you get a little unstuck today. I just wanted you to get a little unstuck. I, I don't feel like I can cast it out of you, but hopefully with the spirit of revelation here that you can just see a little more clearly in areas that you might be stuck and God actually has another door for you to go through. You're not as stuck as you may think you are. Because when you get stuck, when you get, when you get stuck, when you, when, when you, can't, when you can't see that, what, that, that the decisions that have brought you here have got you trapped, your vision gets blurry. You don't know that you have options. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. You don't know. And sometimes when revelation comes, you're like, oh, my gosh, I actually have options. Yeah. Right? A lot of times, like, when, when people deal with rage, they don't know that they can choose not to be in rage. Yeah. Yeah. They just get stuck. Like, that's all they know. Yeah. And then revelation comes, and something lifts off, and they're like, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. I have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Or depression. Same thing. Yeah. Something happens, you fall in depression. You there's something in there that they're stuck in like a cattle chute. Revelation comes. I don't know how it works exactly, but revelation comes. When the spirit of revelation comes, you somehow get power. You get kind of a higher elevation. And then the thing comes, and you say, oh, wait a minute. I have a choice. Yes. Yes. And I see very, very, sometimes, but often not, God rarely just says you're never going to get depressed anymore. What he does is he gives you a viewpoint that you can choose not to be depressed. Yes. It gives you the ability to have a mindset other than depression. Right? He empowers you to make a choice. And I really wish I could wave a wand and say you're not going to have to deal with anything, but it's not biblical. He actually wants to empower you to overcome things. And that includes, that, that, that requires you having choices to overcome them. And so if you're stuck in depression or anxiety, I hope you don't hear me as... as condemning you or saying you're not trying to make a choice. I'm saying sometimes we don't see that there's a choice. And the, and the Lord will come in to help you see that you have a choice. Right? I call that being stuck. Right? And uh, when you, like I said, when you get stuck, your vision gets blurry and you don't, you don't see all your choices. And, and, and like, it's like the old saying right here, I want you to look real close, see the trees? See all the trees, the pretty trees? Sometimes we look at the trees so much we don't see the forest. Right? We're looking for the forest. We can't see the, here's the saying, we can't see the forest through the trees. Yeah. And so we see our problem so much that we cannot see clearly the big picture of what's happening around us. We see the problem, 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 but we don't see that God is all around you. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we don't see. We don't see that God is actually all around us. We're not nearly as stuck as we think we are, and as a matter of fact, when we get with the foggy vision, we don't recognize that God is all around us, and we start thinking it's all on me to make a choice. It's all me to make a decision. It's all on me to break this thing. It's all on me. I have to do more. I have to redu meet this requirement. I have to, I'm, it's because I'm not fasting enough. It's because I'm not in the friends enough. I'm not reading enough Bible. I'm not giving enough. I'm, oh, I know I shouldn't have done that. And it's all this on us. And, and we get so much of that, these three steps to breakthrough and four steps to prosperity and five steps to, 
I don't know what, you know, all these, all, we get so many of these things, we start thinking that it's all in us, we don't recognize that God is actually all around us helping us get unstuck. God is actually all around us helping us getting us unstuck. It's really on Him, right? It's, re- it's really on Him. And so for those of you who can't feel God's path or, or God's way out of your stuck, or maybe you can't even feel God, I just want to really quickly, I just, I just, I just want to, I just want to give you some things because God is not hiding from you today. He's actually hiding for you. God is not hiding from you. I'm telling you today, he's hiding for you. You can't see God because he's, he's where your freedom is. God is hiding in your freedom. And, and, and if you can't feel him where you're at, he's trying to lead you into a place of freedom so you can see him. Does that make sense? He's hiding for you. You don't need him where you are. You need him in freedom. Right? Right? And, and so if you, if you feel stuck in your relationship with God, I, I, you know, we're note takers here. So, so we, so I'm going to write down a couple things uh, that might help if you're stuck in your relationship with God, right? Right? And these are profound. I'm here to let you know. Watch out. These might be in philosophy books 200 years from now, right? These are, these are deep and they're complex and they're hard to grasp. So you might need to write them down and meditate on these things because we take notes. Ready? Here's the first one. You ready? Do something. (laughs) Do something. When you get stuck, you wind up not doing anything because you're stuck. And you get terrified. If I do something, it might be the wrong something. But you fail to recognize things can't get much worse. (laughs) Like, we fail to realize like, it can't get much worse. Do something. Right? So if you're stuck, I don't know where God is, do something. Ask someone to do something. Like, like reach out, pray in the Holy Ghost. That, my, my, my favorite do something is just pray in tongues, right? Just pray in the Holy Ghost till something happens, right? Do worship. Do, if you're stuck in any situation with God, it could be financial, it, it, it could be relational, it, it could be uh, educational, do something. If you are stuck in debt way over your head uh, uh, and you're like making your minimum payments, pay an extra $3 a month. Do something so you can start feeling like you have power over this thing. If depression is all over and you can't get out of bed, get out of bed, make your bed, and lay on top of the bed, right? Do something. Right? Do something, right? Now, if you're stuck in your relationship with God, and I, I truly believe this next one, invite someone to Easter service. I don't, it, it, like, like, you don't have to win the lost in mass. You don't have to lead a revival at the bus stop. You don't have to lead a revival at your workplace. Something supernatural happens when you take part in the ministry of Jesus Christ and you invite someone to church. We have the cards in, 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 the, in the room there in our lobby, and all you have to do is hand someone a card. Come to Easter. That will break off fear of man and evangelism in your life. That will, it will break it off in your life. You will begin to actually have a flow of the Holy Ghost in your life that you've never had before as you begin to take part in evangelism for Jesus. Again, you don't even have to tell people about Jesus. Just invite them to church, right? Invite them to come fellowship. Invite them to the house of God. Just invite someone this week to come fellowship. It will break something off your life. Are are you getting this? So if you feel stuck in your relationship with God, next thing I want to recommend that will help get you unstuck, serve someone. Serve someone that you think is beneath you. Serve someone beneath you. Find someone that you think doesn't deserve your help and serve them some way. That humility that comes through that, that humility actually brings grace. Humility brings grace. And as you bow down, as you lean down, as you get low to serve someone low, Jesus will meet you there. Jesus will meet you there. Jesus will meet you in your serving. 
Like, just start carrying money in your car if you've got a couple extra bucks and give them to people begging on the side of the road. You know what they're using that money for? Drugs, most likely. But you don't know that. They don't deserve your money. That's who you need to give money to. Jesus sees it. Jesus sees it. Jesus sees it. That's who you need to serve, the person you don't think who deserves your money. That annoying family member. Call them on Easter and tell them you love them. Serve somebody. Right? Are, are you guys feeling me on this right here? I'm just trying to give you some, since we're note takers, I'm trying to give you some, I'm trying to just give you some practical, practical things right here. Honor authority. Serve someone beneath you, serve someone above you. Honor an authority in your life. Give an offering. Do something for their life. Do something for someone who has blessed you. If you had a mentor at work, maybe it's not a spiritual mentor, but maybe somebody gave you opportunity at work, do, buy them lunch. Do, do certain, this is a countercultural to honor people like this, but do something for someone who doesn't need your serving. Are you getting, I'm telling you, this is going to get you unstuck. Are, 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 are you with me? Ready, next one? Are we good? Give in secret. Do something in a way that you can get no reward for it. Give in secret. Send, send, send an offering anonymously. Stick money in somebody's Bible when they're not around. Just give in secret. Send someone cash. And, and, and when they tell you about it, don't giggle. I like to buy people's lunch, like we're at a restaurant. And I like to just go to the waiter. I want to buy their lunch on my way out. I really enjoy that. Yeah. And just, you don't even get to see them get the check and be like, no, no. And it's pretty funny when you do it and you make the, like the waiter promise not to tell that you did it. And they go to like, they're sitting there forever. The couple will be just sitting there forever waiting for the check, not recognizing the check was already paid. Like they didn't know the check was paid for it. And they just sit there forever. They start to get kind of irritated. Like, when's the check coming? And finally, they flag down the waiter, forget the check. Like, Oh, someone already paid it. Oh, I feel like an idiot, right? But we just serve someone in secret. You never know. Just let the Holy Spirit prompt you. Just, just give in secret, right? Give, give in secret, right? And here's the last one. This one's super, super, super spiritual. Just get a little unstuck. Just get a, you know, you know what stuck feels like, right? You know what it feels like when you're stuck somewhere. Are you with me? You know what it feels like to be a little bit stuck. Just get You'll know what it feels like to get just a little unstuck. Just do something in that area that you feel stuck to get a little unstuck. You know, and it doesn't matter what your issue is. You know, if you're, if you're a hoarder, just throw something away, right? Like, if you've got a hygiene issue, just brush your teeth before you come to church, right? Just like, just, just get a little unstuck. You know what stuck is. He's going to get a little, yeah. are you hearing me? Yeah. Jesus is with you just to push you. Like, don't look at the whole thing like I got to fix this whole problem today. Right? Like, I feel called to lead worship, and I don't know how to play guitar, and I don't know how to sing. Well, just decide I'm going to start singing over some Hillsong tracks. Just get a little, a little, a little unstuck. Just get them, just get, a, are, does this make any sense? Yeah. I'm just trying to be practical right there, you know? And so Stephen is here saying, hey, I don't know if you guys remember this days that you were worshiping here, but y'all were stuck in idol worship. Like, you're talking about these glory days, and you're so scared that we're going to interrupt what Moses did in, in the law, but y'all didn't follow him. And not for nothing, can I remind you that, you know, in Acts 7.43 says, also, when you guys were in these glory days that you're talking about, you took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god of Rapha, the images which you made to worship. Acting like you're all high and mighty and you're so pure and, and we're here to mess up your pure thing. Not for nothing. Y'all carried idols the entire time you were out there. Not for nothing. Not for nothing, but he's saying, y'all need to unload a little baggage as well, right? And so I'm here to let you know today, you may need to unload a little baggage. To get unstuck, you may need to unload a little baggage. Maybe, maybe. Maybe it's a mindset that you've got to finally say, I'm not carrying this with me into the promised land. 
Maybe, maybe you have some life goals that have not been bathed and saturated in prayer. Maybe you've been following a life goal for so long and you're depressed it's not coming to pass. Maybe it's not actually been saturated in prayer. And, and it's possible that that life goal has become an idol. And once you saturate it in prayer, God's going to bring it out like gold and show you what the true thing is, right? Maybe, maybe there's some friendships that you have matured past and are now baggage that need to be wow. let go of. See, don't, don't, don't ever be ashamed if you grow out of a friendship. As you're growing and becoming more comfortable with yourself, as you're maturing into who Christ has called you to be, there's always going to be some folks that are called to come with you on the journey but choose not to. And you don't have to feel bad that they don't want to come on the journey with you. Sometimes you just got to say, this, like, I'm, I am going this way. And I understand you want me to come back for you time and again, but I really need to go where I am going. And this baggage that has tied you has got you stuck. We just need to drop some baggage, right? And, and, you know, as you mature, you mature out of some relationships. You mature out of some, some situations, right? And, and we have to come to the place where, we, we have to come to the place where we say, we don't know everything Christ is doing in our life, right? We don't, we have to be okay with the mystery. I feel stuck, but Jesus is with me and I'm actually doing what I'm called to do right now. I'm walking forward. I'm maturing. I'm becoming the person he's called me to be, yet I still don't know when this thing's going to come to pass. We, we talked about this last week, that if we're going to be a prophetic people and we're going to see into the future, that means we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that there is a future and I'm not in it yet. Right? Like, I'm going to just keep saying that in this season. If we can see into the future, we can't be mad that it's not the future right now. We've got to come to grips with the fact that there is a future we're working toward. Does that make sense? We don't know everything. And, and Paul actually said it this way to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 4.1. He says, let a man regard us in this manner, and this is us, servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. I serve Jesus in everything he tells me to do. I, I serve him. I'm a servant of Christ. I've given my life to Jesus. I follow him. I obey Holy Spirit in his leading. And I am still at the same time stewarding the mystery. I'm not taking the mystery out of this thing. I'm not taking the mystery out of following Jesus. I'm not letting people know I have the answer to everything and I fully understand what's happening and I know how everything's going to turn out. Can I just let you know, we need to recapture some language uh, that maybe the old saints used, like little things like, Lord willing, I will be able to do this. Lord willing, I will have a business one day and employ lots of people. Lord willing, come on. Lord willing, one day I will have a ministry and that will happen. Lord willing, I will come and own a home. Lord willing, I will have many children, right? We have to come, we have to like, we have to recapture some of this language instead of believing the people who tell us that everything we want is three or four steps away. It's, it's just not true. Come on. Amen. Amen. I just, I simply just don't know. And Lord willing, these things will happen. Because it really pushes it off to, it's not all on me. I actually have, I actually have a redeemer. And he's the one redeeming me. It's not me. I don't put myself into the place of redeemer. And so Stephen's telling these people that this obedience to Moses, that you're putting me on trial for didn't actually work for you. This didn't actually work, see? And what I'm talking about here is religion re reduces faith to a formula. Religion reduces faith to a formula. And if the formula didn't work, the fault is yours. Right? Right? This is what cults do. This is what cults do. And uh, a lot of, I don't want to go that far, but some, you know, we can be, have cultic tendencies without being in a cult, right? And there's some things that Christians can kind of fall into that aren't Christianity, there's something else, right? And, and there's just like, <clears throat> like I believe in holiness, how about you? I believe sin is bad, yeah? Yeah. And so what cults do is we say we, oh, we believe in holiness, uh, but they don't have a, a God who's present. And so they have to make up rules to feel holy. 
I don't know if you saw this on social media. It was trending this week. I, uh, I, was, I don't know if you know this, but I study cults. I don't know if I've told you that in a while. I, I, I just, we, we were in a bit of a controlling environment, my wife and I, at one point. Never since then, I've just studied cults. I hate cults. Uh, I hate cultic tendencies. I hate people controlling people. I just hate it in general. Uh, but I study cults, and um, I have studied um, Mormonism, like, extensively the last uh, year, uh, like, like a lot, a lot, like probably too much. Like, I had a dream the other week that they were actually telling me, why am I not coming to temple anymore? And I'm like, I've, I've never been a Mormon. I don't understand, and I'm not going to become one, right? Like, so I study them a lot. And so I noticed on social media, uh, there, uh, a new Instagram account uh, popped up. It's called Honor Code Stories. And um, <clears throat> at, at, at the Mormon College, BYU, uh, they have this honor code, which sounds great. Uh, they have an honor code that you've got to live for God, you can't be in sin, and you've got to follow the false prophet, and uh, they, my term, not theirs, um, and, and all this stuff. But there's only one way to enforce that, and that's like almost North Korea, everybody is expected to spy on everybody else. And if your roommate is doing something, uh, and they find out about it, and you didn't report them, now you have violated the honor code as well, right? It's just, it's crazy. Uh, and so if you look at this um, Instagram account, Honor Code Stories, if you've ever suffered sexual trauma or anything like that, it, you know, it, it could be kind of triggering because it's kind of crazy. But uh, let me give you an example of one story. Let me say this first before you put that up. If you complain about the church at all, they consider that a violation of the Honor Code. And if you violate the Honor Code and you go to their college, they can kick you out and not let your, your credits transfer to another college. So you'd be like a junior, and they say that you're not worthy to come to the school anymore, and they just don't let your credit, credit transfer. You just lost three years of college. Cult, right? Are we, are, are we on the same page here? Cult. There's people who, who graduate, and at the end of the graduation, they found out something that happened three years earlier, like, like they were in their girlfriend's bedroom after, after curfew, even though they didn't have sex, and they consider that a, va- a violation of the chastity vow. And they therefore suspend them from college, even though they've just graduated, and they won't release their transcripts. That's insane, right? That's a little crazy. That's what cults do, though, in the name of purity. So here's one. Let me just give you a real quick example of what I'm talking about here. It says, <clears throat> someone wrote this in anonymously. I was suspended for three semesters for attempting suicide because my attempt involved alcohol and pills. During the meeting with the honor code uh, team, I was supposed to explain myself, and I was fresh out of the psych ward. I just sobbed and sobbed while I was walking, while I was talked to like I was a stupid child. I was blamed for not reading scriptures and studying the gospel enough. They brought up how I failed a religion class my first semester and went on and on about how many other kids would love a spot at the university that I was wasting. I withdrew and never went back. That's cultic right there, right? Are we on the same page here? But what they're saying here is everything about your holiness is on you, and if you fail, it's because of you. There is no place for redemption, no place for Jesus. This, this, is, what, this is what religion looks like, right? <clears throat> and so I, I put this together on um, this Wednesday, and, and I had some people over on Thursday. And Thursday night, you know what happened? Mormons showed up at my door. It was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. I was so excited. I was like, oh, my gosh, I've been studying you guys for years. I didn't tell them this. And you're finally here. This is great. Come on in. Come on in. We're here. We're, you know, we're, we're here just telling people about Jesus Christ. I'm thinking, I tell people about Jesus Christ too. Come on. <laughs> this is awesome. So we're eating dinner. I asked them, you know, these missionaries, they're, they're, just, they, they're trying to serve God, Mike. They're trying. Like, like they're trying. Like they're trying. They don't know. They're, they're stuck. They're stuck. And their vision is not clear because they don't have Holy Spirit opening options, right? So they're stuck. And I'm like, hey, you guys want something to eat? And I, I, I kind of know their lingo, right? And so I start using their lingo. I'm like, hey, you know, guys want to come in? I was like, how's your mission going? Like, they're big conferences this weekend. I'm like, I, like there's a rumor that they're going to they're gonna turn the mission to 18 months. What do you think? They're like, oh, you knew the rumor? I'm like, yeah, I just heard the rumor. What do you think? They're like, oh, I don't know if it's going to happen in 24 months. And I was like, oh, man, that's pretty neat. I was like, oh, hey, you know, I heard that they're going to let you guys drink coffee. Might happen. They're like, no, that would never happen as an addictive substance. I was like, yeah, but you never know. You know, 
And so I said, hey, you know, if you guys ever get kind of tired, now I'm trying to, now, now, now we're making friends, right? <clears throat> I tell them, hey, if you guys are ever tired, you're trying to get away from your mission, you can tell them that I'm an investigator. That's their term for someone when they, like, make a conversation with you and, like, you might be interested. You're officially an investigator. And once you become an investigator, you can spend time at their house. So I'm just, I'm trying to give them, a, I'm trying to give them an option. I'm just trying to give them an option. I'm like, hey, if you guys are ever tired or burnt out or things get rough, like, you can let them know that I'm an investigator, right? And you can come over here anytime you want. Like, I can be an, a golden investigator. That's like, that's like, you're, like you're about to get baptized kind of person. Just let them know. I'm like, uh, I'm a, it's like I said, I, you know, I'm already Christian, you know, but you can come over here and hang out whatever you want. And, uh, and then, so we, we were talking a little bit, and I said, I had a lot of people there. And I, and I said, you know, I, I just want to be honest with you. I'm a Christian, and, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't actually believe that, you know, your book is true. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe the book of Abraham is true. I think it's demonstrably false that the Native Americans are not the lost tribe of Israel. And uh, this, all the revelations, like Joseph Smith, he kind of made a bunch of it up. And it's, you know, it's, 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 it's actually all based on the Masonic Temple. It's really kind of weird. But, hey, anytime you guys want to come over, I'm here for you. Because I, I opened the Bible and I said, hey, gosh, I'm going late. Can I just finish this story? And, and, okay. So I'm talking to them. And, and before I said that, I pull out the Bible. I pull out John chapter one and I start reading John chapter one to them because, you know, they believe the whole goal of becoming a Mormon is that you can, you can become a God like Jesus. Yeah. Jesus was once a man and then he became a God as he matured through their religious system, yeah. right? And then he gets his own planet. And so I start reading John chapter one to them and I'm like, you know, it says I hear that Jesus in the beginning was God. I just don't see if you read this, that he was God from the beginning, how you can get a doctrine that he became God, because the Bible clearly says that's not true. And so I don't really, that's when I started telling him, I don't believe the book of Abraham, and I don't, I just don't believe these other books, but hey, anytime you want to get away, we're here, right? Like, I could, hey, you know, now, 10 years ago, I would have tried to cast the devil out of him, right? Like, that's what I would have done and argue with them and try to, but here's what's kind of funny, as we were talking to him, and, and there's a couple of ladies who were here who were at my house that night, as we were talking to him, now, you can believe this or not. You know sometimes you cast the devil out of people and they manifest this stuff, right? You've seen that, right? Flies and all kind of crazy stuff. So these gnats start coming off, right? And they're like, as I'm talking, they're like gnats. Like these gnats start flying around their head. I'm like, deliverance is happening in my doorway. This is awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. They're like swatting at these gnats. I was like, sweet deliverance. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, right? But sometimes that's just what we need. We just need prophetic truth to come. And to... Now, now I, I, I'm going long, but I'm... Oh, my gosh. Okay, I don't know how I'm going to bring this in for landing. But when this prophetic anointing comes, sometimes you, offenses may come with it. Yeah. And you're going to get offended at people, and you're going to think it's them, but it's, it's God stirring up the baggage that you've brought on this journey that you were supposed to let go of a long time ago. Some idols get poked, and all of a sudden you think it's the person poking it. Yeah. What do you mean get rid of our golden calf? Yeah, but... We need, to abra- we need to embrace the mystery of Christ and trust that he's with us. Are, are you with me? Amen. And so Stephen's saying, listen, while, while you're worshiping Moses, you're worshiping the law, there's someone you forgot to worship. Right? He says, Acts 7.30. He says, after 40 years had passed, look at this, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness in Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning bush. Now, when you read the Old Covenant without Holy Spirit, you don't get revelation. You read the old, the Hebrew Bible through the new covenant, you start seeing stuff. Are you with me? Right? We want to see it through revelation of the new covenant. Look, he says, he says, let me back it up one more time. Acts 7.30, he says, after 40 years had passed, you remember the burning bush, right? You remember the, anybody remember the burning bush? Anybody remember Moses in the wilderness? Remember he had an assistant? Who was his assistant? Let's look what the Bible actually says. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning bush. That angel was Jesus. Watch this. He said in Acts 7.32, I am the God of your fathers. That's what the angel in the bush said. Ain't no bush the God of your fathers. No bush is the God of your fathers. No angel is the God of your fathers. Jesus. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Acts 7.35. Look, he says, this Moses... The one whom God sent, excuse me, this most God who sent to be both ruler and a deliverer with the help of
Do you see this? Let's look at it. Moses who disowned you, who made a judgment ruler, is the one whom God sent to be both ruler and judge and a deliverer with the help of the who delivered to him in the thorn of the bush. Verse 38, this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai, who was with our fathers. This is Jesus. This is what Steve is trying to tell him. Listen, you're persecuting me. You're giving the wrong people credit for our deliverance. You got religion and you got formulas and you got all this stuff and you think we did it on our own and I am somehow defiling this, but the one who really should be getting worship right now is Jesus. You're persecuting me for letting you know that the one who was in the bush, actually the word shows us was God and his name is Jesus Christ. I want to let you know right now, while you're in the midst of your struggle, you're in the midst of your hardship, you aren't alone. The angel of the Lord is with you today. Amen? Come on, give it up. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I want you to leave here today knowing that you are not alone. I want you to leave here today knowing that you are not alone. If you look back over your life right now, you will probably even notice all those times that you had struggle, crying out, God, where are you? He was right there with you. Amen? You could probably even to look back right now, man, he was with me the whole time. You didn't know how you were going to make it through that thing. You didn't know how you were going to make it. But here you are today. Amen? Amen. You made it. I'm here to tell you today, stand with me. You have a Savior. You have something better than a burning bush. You have help in time of need. And you have a message of freedom for this generation that sits on your life as your testimony of who Jesus is. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? I want you to leave here today. I want you to leave here today knowing that God is with you. That you are not alone. And that you have a Savior. Kelly, won't you sing? Let's sing this song before we go. The one who made the stars is smiling down on us with love in his eyes for all. Yes, there's going to be people right up the front at the end here. And we're going to have the invitation cards in the, in the lobby. But we're going to sing this out right now. We're going to have an encounter with God that we're going to take to the world. Come on. The ones he gave you life to see. And you'd go to the ends of the earth just to take hold of me, won't let go of me, cause I know that I can trust you, you've been good for a long time, I know that I can trust you, you've been good for a long time, I know that I can trust you, you've been good for a long time, I know that I can trust you, you've been good for a long time. Hallelujah, can you give it up for the preach word this morning? Thank you, Pastor Carl. Mike and Kelly are going to stay here leading worship for a little while longer. We're going to have a prayer team at the front. If you need prayer this morning, if you're a little stuck, no matter where you are today, you can do something even before you leave here by responding to the word, coming forward, and getting prayer. You can do something, and I just want to encourage you today, before you leave, whether or not you come up to get prayer, just decide what that something is for you this week. What you're going to do to respond to the word of the Lord this morning. Amen. Give it up one more, more time for Jesus. Say hello to somebody you didn't come with. Come forward and get prayer. If you need healing in your body, if you're dealing with something this week, come forward and talk to somebody. Amen. And on your way out, grab one of our invitation cards for Easter service. Give it to somebody this week. Give it to a friend, a family member, a co-worker. Invite somebody who needs to hear the gospel. Invite somebody who's without a church. Invite somebody who doesn't have a community of believers who's away from Jesus to Easter this year. Amen. God bless you guys. Have an amazing week. We will see you again next week. Oh, all through the years you've had
my back. 